At the T-minus three-minute mark, tape recorders on board the spacecraft were turned on. These recorders record both voice and data. This is Rocket Shop Radio Hour. I'm Caleb Humphrey, your guest host tonight, filling in for Tom Proctor. Rocket Shop Radio Hour is Vermont's weekly local music show featuring artists performing live and sharing their unique personalities and inspirations. Rocket Shop is supported in part by an award from the Burlington City Arts Community Fund. This program is also supported in part by Advanced Music, a full-line music store offering instruments and gear, band and orchestra rentals, electronic and stringed instruments, and repair services. You're local, we're local, Advance. It's been all about the music for more than 30 years. Located at 75 Maple Street in Burlington and online at advancemusicvt.com. Tonight I'm here with my guest, Ren Kitts. Hello. How's it going tonight? It's going good. I've, I've been admiring your radio voice for the last uh, minute or so. That was nice. Thank you. I'm pretty new at this, so that, that means a lot to me. Well, I, mean, <laughs> I am too, but uh, yeah, there's been a couple of times where I've had the opportunity to go on the radio. And <clears throat> once there was a very nice woman at Vermont Public Radio who told mm-hmm. me I had a very good radio voice. And, you do. Yeah, I'd agree with that statement. I wondered if you know, maybe I should try to change my career and focus on my voice. <laughs> but uh, you know, here I am still making noise with tape machines. Right, on that grind. Yeah. yeah. So, so It's a tough job, but someone has to do it. Yeah. You're very, you have a very calming voice, I think. Oh, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, but the real topic of tonight um, is your music. I know recently you put out an album on NNA Tapes um, earlier this summer, right? Yeah, that was early June that that came out. Mm -hmm. That record was called Dancing on Soda Lake. Yeah, NNA Tapes put it out. That was um, really great to be on board with with that label. Yeah, they're really always been a very eclectic label, but it feels like recently um, they've really picked up the pace with the amount of releases and they're, uh, it feels like there's a lot of momentum behind that label right now. Yeah, um, Toby and Matt who run the label really they, they work so incredibly hard to kind of keep mm. keep it going and the curation is always on point uh, to me and yeah, the thing is that they're both kind of working other jobs too and NNA just like keeps keeps going and that's what I've heard uh, friends have told me NNA has just run out of Toby's living room like it's a very uh, it, it has a certain publicity online a certain reputation I feel like in certain circles but it's still just a few guys in a living room and in a very like DIY um, sense of things yeah you know it's certainly not at like the top of a castle or anything right it's not sub pop yeah it's it's not I mean the space is nice. It mm-hmm. is in an apartment building, but it's yeah. I was like hanging out with friends. Convenient, uh, nice to be able to just talk mm-hmm. um, right to someone's voice instead of emailing all the time. Yeah, and you actually know the people who are dealing with your music, which yeah. is always a little bit more reassuring. Totally. Yeah. yeah. But there's also yeah. I think I, I valued a lot of. This is the first time I ever worked with a label. Uh, I'm kind of I guess still fairly new at putting out music on labels and NNA was the first who um, really did give me a lot of feedback like during the process of making the record Um, they had reached out to me before um, I had recorded it and kind of said we would like to put it out but also would want to hear kind of like how it's coming and yeah, really be involved with the process. Yeah, it was neat to have them involved. And mm-hmm. they were able to give really good feedback at times that kind of made me re- rethink certain things. And um, it was, yeah, that was fun. And Ryan Power, who recorded it. Or I was just about to ask about that. Yeah, he's an NNA artist. So it, it kind of had this big, like, family group hug feeling. Yeah, like that very communal Vermont 
aesthetic to things. Yeah, it was yeah. nice. What was it like working with Ryan Power? Because he is, um, I feel like in some circles, pretty sought after as far as um, on the engineering side of music production. And also, like, I know he recently moved to Brooklyn, but for a while he was a local celebrity of sorts around Burlington. Um, but I was, uh, this is my personal belief, but I always had this idea that he was like this reclusive genius type who's just constantly like slogging over a mixing board and <laughs> like trying to make his masterpiece. And maybe he did, because I know he just put out a double album. Um, I haven't heard it yet, but just wondering what your experience was like working with Ryan. Yeah, well, I mean, he is kind of that way that you described. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, I hear he's a perfectionist. He, he, <laughs> he definitely is with his own music. Yeah, um, and it, it's and it suits what he's what he's doing. I think musically. Mm -hmm. But any, yeah, we're and we're all kind of perfectionists in our own music. That's it's wild. like, a, yeah, the it's like raising things. a child. Yeah, when you're making an album and you're listening to the track so many different times it, it's hard not to get really obsessive about like little things but mm -hmm. and that's something that I, I've tried to let go of over the years is just kind of you know the, these li these little things mm -hmm. in, in recording but but yeah Ryan I mean he was becoming a, a close friend during the process of recording and mm -hmm. um I think you know when we started that that project, I had already mixed uh, my last album with him, and um, we had known each other for a while. So oh, cool! So this wasn't a new experience for you then, working no, together. No, it, it was like it was not it was not an unfamiliar experience, and and definitely one that I had really um, yeah I, I looked forward to. I, like, mm -hmm. It's almost now that Rise in Brooklyn. You know, it's hard to, like, now that I'm thinking about recording some new music, I'm kind of, like, drawing blank, because mm -hmm. just Ryan was always the person that I would go to for that in Vermont. But I know right. there's lots of other amazing recording artists uh, all, all around Burlington and, and beyond. But. Yeah, definitely some people who just no one really knows about yet, but are incredibly talented. Yeah, um, absolutely. To seem, at least lately, like there's a lot of musical energy just around Burlington right now. It feels like a pretty inspiring time to live here. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. I've seen you perform, I think, around four or five times now. I remember I saw you once play at New City Gallery a few years ago with a full band. You had a cello player, um, a drummer, bassist, you know, a typical rhythm section. Then I once also saw, also saw you play at Pushing a Brain Up a Hill, I believe it was last year which was held at the bca and you were performing using a reel-to-reel -reel with the tape um stretched out and rung around a microphone stand and then that was playing and creating weird loops and creating a really interesting sound then i saw you one other time perform at the attic um i believe it was two summers ago where you just played with a guitar and you sang your songs, but I remember the, like the lighting was on point, and it um, just had such a vibe to what it was you were doing. And um, they're all like really incredible, really interesting performances. But um, that was a very long-winded intro to this question I'm about to ask you. But why, why is it you do so many different things when you perform live? Like why not have one set routine or? Um, something that's a little bit easier to manage like it, you just come off as being like a renaissance man yeah of sorts of burlington that's and interesting you're always uh trying to push yourself to do different things you know it, it feels like every time i've seen you it definitely was not a repeat of the last time yeah well you know first of all and not answering your question with, with this statement but i <laughs> thank you for taking me down that nice memory lane because <laughs> yeah. i remember all i'm actually your biggest fan <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well thank you it, it was uh because each one of those shows i you know i had this great opportunity to play a lot of concerts over the last few years and a mm -hmm. lot of them in vermont and um I, re I remember every single one of them, but sometimes, you know, when, when you say a venue, it's like, oh, like, which one is he talking about? So you being able to recount things like lighting and 
I'm like, oh yeah, I totally remember that show. Like, I might even yeah. remember the shirt that I was wearing and the burrito that I ate before. <laughs> right. You know, like it's all coming back to me now. Um, but yeah, I think that when I um, when I started wanting to play uh, m- more uh, mm-hmm. the, like of my solo music, I wanted to have a band, but I also wanted to be able to keep playing solo when the opportunity came. And yeah. I think I just always had a feeling of if I was going to be playing, in, say, in Burlington, like a couple times a month, that it would be much more exciting if every time it was a little bit different. Right, if it was unpredictable um, in a way. Yeah, I, I liked, there was some artists that I had seen over the years, uh, like one that I remember well was Kurt Wiseman, and I think he might even be a Vermont person. Um, Is he related to Chris Wiseman at all? Yes, a, bro- a brother, of the brother of Chris Oh, Wiseman. odd, yeah, I've never heard of Kurt Wiseman? Yeah. Was that it? Okay. Yeah, and r- really... Is he uh, from Brattleboro? I don't, you know, I can't recall. Yeah. Uh, he might be from Brattleboro, um, mm. or like the Putney area or something. Yeah. But I'm not really sure. I just, I had seen him play a couple of times, and it was really wonderful to be able to one time see him play kind of like classical mm-hmm. guitar and sing these wonderful melodies and then mm-hmm. i saw him play again not too much long after that and he was playing um just like electronic hardware and it was more of like an experimental like st- some music concrete style yeah, you know just m- kind of music. like a more in the vein of like a sound collage kind of set yeah like, uh, computer based an electronic bass and it was it was really good so it was kind of like wow like it's really fun to be able to see other artists who clearly can focus on songwriting and really care about crafting a song but also really enjoy this completely other genre almost Um, right find a completely other language to express themselves in yeah and 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 those are two worlds that that i think that i've been interested in for uh Every uh, you know, every year I can remember playing music. Mm-hmm. That was kind of the idea: was how can I incorporate these two things that I love, both um, performing and listening to, and being part of the communities of, and uh, how do I kind of make a, an album or a recording or play a concert that kind of can hold mm-hmm. all of the qualities that I enjoy in music right. the most. But I think that's been really challenging and kind of might explain why there's so many different feelings at different shows is Mm -hmm. because more recently it's been you know sometimes it's the same but almost more extreme like sometimes i'll bring an acoustic guitar and just play like five like singer songwriter songs right and then another time i have like multiple amplifiers and like a reel to reel and like three Mm -hmm. different cassette players and a mixer and it's like i don't you know, I'm just, yeah. maybe I'm confused about <laughs> what I want to be, yeah. but, but I have fun doing both, so. Right, it's a just one giant experiment. Yeah, I remember watching, um, who did it? Oh, I think it was Noise Ordinance. They put together a really quick documentary about your album release show that just happened in our backyard over the summer. And I think you, um, in the video, it had footage of people like, duct taping CD players and radios onto the walls and the idea was during certain points of the show you're going to turn them on and do a collage of radio broadcast or something like that I wasn't there for it so I don't know but it sounded really cool yeah you know it's funny I was barely there for it too it, like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean I was very present in my own uh, yeah. mind at that show I was I think I was just focused on what what I was doing, and that mm-hmm. was like that band had gotten to be such a I don't know just like force of its own that everyone I think going into shows was feeling really confident in in their role, and then as like a a whole, I think that we all like at that at that period of time mm-hmm. especially kind of all felt so comfortable playing with one another that it just, right. You know, there'd still be the regular butterflies, I think, before playing a show, but I always felt really confident in, like, the, the players that I was with, and 
when Ross uh, Dore, the bass player, was mm-hmm. like taping boom boxes to the walls in like the back of the room, I was just like, oh, yeah, that's Ross. He's doing his thing. Like, I w- oh, that wasn't even your idea. I wasn't even sure what he was doing, oh. really. He yeah. told me in the beginning about this idea of like um, having an extension cord that was running to various speakers around the room so that mm-hmm. at one point during the performance he could just plug it in and like five different speakers that were all over the room would would turn on right be like a wall of sound yeah and weird and it happened it, in a way but it was hard for us in the front of the stage to know what it sounded like in the in the back but there was definitely some feedback at the end people that were in the back that got like blasted by a speaker that they were didn't know was there <laughs> yeah. that was kind of fun. snuck up behind them right um yeah so how did you get into that side of music the idea of using tape loops or like non-conventional instrumentation like using a reel-to-reel to perform live and you know stuff that's very out in left field because i feel like especially in burlington there isn't really a scene for that. There's not really a lot of people doing that, maybe in other parts of Vermont. But um, I remember when I saw you perform with just the reel-to-reel machine just being like kind of taken aback because that's something you'd see more in like a large city like Brooklyn or somewhere. Um, I just I thought it was very interesting to see someone in Burlington performing like that because I don't think a lot of people go to a show unless they're familiar with your work and really expect that. So... Um, yeah, what was your story like leading up to that interest and that fascination with that style? Yeah, that's I don't know, that, that's a that's a good question. I'm going to have to travel back in time to try to recall. I think mm-hmm. I mean in the beginning of my uh when I was at college, I remember that was kind of the first time I had an electric guitar and an amplifier and mm-hmm. I think that I was less inclined though I like learned guitar because I wanted to just play Grateful Dead songs and like right. you know, like learn the, the Bob Marley riff or whatever <laughs> you know, when I was like a young high school kid but um, in college I had this I had gotten this electric guitar and an amp and I, uh, someone got me a loop station like a, a former um, co-worker of mine when I was in high school gave me a loop station and mm-hmm. I think I just started playing less with like my hands and playing more with like the loop station and just like whatever items were in the room to like bang on very cool guitar. I, and I think that that was probably around the time that I was like learning about and being exposed to more of like this kind of like noisy music yeah like, that there was it tends at, to happen around like your yeah, first year of college when you're more that high school phase kind of yeah. happens and I think at the end of high school I was listening to um you know, like uh, all sorts of weird things, but a lot of post rock during that time. Mm-hmm. And like, I think bands like um, Do Make Say Think or Godspeed You Black Emperor, these bands that were kind of like these big cacophonous, like uh, kind of orchestral bands that yeah. had like a certain darkness that led me to discover other things, I think, through labels like i remember kind of digging into different things on that constellation record label out of montreal Mm -hmm. and i was finding things um that were just a lot more like far out and i think it's funny that lee ronaldo's playing next door tonight because that was another like getting into sonic youth and um kind of going down that rabbit hole and there's really like they have so many different uh albums but, but like some of their earlier things were, were pretty far out from my brain at that yeah you have to be in the right headspace to but listen was, to their early but, stuff but i liked it you know yeah. and i wanted to uh i wanted to emulate it or um figure out how to like make you know weird loops while i played my guitar with like yeah that bridge between like avant-garde and rock and roll yeah yeah i think it wasn't until much later that had a friend who I was living with who had like a handheld tape recorder Mm -hmm. and would just like you know record songs that she was writing and we were playing we were writing songs together and we'd we'd record them to tape so that we could remember and I think I started using it and and getting like 
just really excited about like anything that I recorded and mm-hmm. you know I hadn't had that little kid excitement in in years so yeah just going out and like recording like a wind chime or like a car going by and then I'd get home and listen to it and I'd be like you know giggling it was like this very strange experience but I just loved like the idea of capturing something um and also just like the idea of a cassette and watching it move and yeah and then there's just the sound of a cassette too because it always has that hum in the background and it's very a uh, very unpolished representation of whatever you record in like there's this um kind of automatically adds this otherworldly quality to whatever you record yeah and i think from there it was um i think it was just influence you know i had some friends who were recording music with real to real machines and i just thought that they were cool you know mm-hmm. and i remember seeing a uh, an artist who actually did put out a tape on NNA tapes. Jason Lescalite was his name, and okay. he, he performed in in Burlington a number of years ago. And he had like a couple reel to reel machines, and I thought that his performance was was mind blowing. And I didn't really know. How. Was that all he used? Was just reel to reel? Among other things, he had um, some electronics, but there there was two reel to reels and a couple of. Um, cassette recorders that it seemed like he was record he was recording like the whole time and then playing back and Mm -hmm. there was an idea that he he was kind of recording the room uh it didn't make any sense to me to be (laughs) honest i i I loved sitting in like the, the the room that was kind of just filled with ambient cacophony but it was like Mm -hmm. uh i can't i can't recall that i understood what was going on yeah. Which was also really exciting to me and something that I thought seemed really fun. Um, and there were, you know, I can remember a few times playing um, with bigger kind of analog setups where I liked the idea that people wouldn't necessarily understand where the sounds were coming from. Mm-hmm. And there was, I remember one time in particular someone came up to me and and said something along the lines of like you know that was a very magical experience like i don't know if i really liked the music that you were playing but (laughs) watching the like you would be playing your guitar with both hands but then like something on the table below you would start spinning and i I just didn't understand how (laughs) everything was working i thought that was kind of (laughs) cool yeah they may have not been into it but at least it pushed them out of their comfort zone yeah yeah yeah. So would you want to take a break for a few minutes and possibly play some music? Yeah, playing no, um, music sounds sounds great. Yeah. Is there any preference for um, which track you want to share with us first? Well, I feel like, I guess based on our conversation thus far, it could be... Um, it could be nice to play something from the NNA release, um, Dancing on Soda Lake any song that that you choose really there's there's all types of different songs <laughs> <laughs> we have to some short some long <laughs> um, you want to start with haunted hole sure yeah that's go with that good. one <laughs> leave these guys on <laughs> technical so difficulties we're currently experiencing tef- technical difficulties here on Rocket Shop, so we had to pause the music that you probably couldn't even hear. So, so it, it keeps. It was, it keeps there was a John Cage exciting, cover yeah. by Ren Kitts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very, very out there. Yeah. Luckily, we have Bob here who's able yeah, to. Yeah, we'll start poking. I think. We wish Brian was here. <laughs> Brian's our master. Uh, don't sell yourself self short, Bob. You got it. Yeah, we'll see. Um. Well, you know, the good news is that I'm prepared with a whole, like, uh, acapella set. So, you know, if, if the music doesn't work, I can Right, just, you just snap your fingers I'll and the bopper shop quartet sure. comes yeah. from behind the corner. <laughs> but we are in luck because we just loaded this up. So what were you playing? Oh, uh, we were playing Haunted Hole. So we're going to play that off... Uh, oh, Bob's one step ahead of us. Here we go. We're going to play it off of the, the other computer. The automation. Which would be this guy. There we go.
So that was Haunted Hole by Ren Kitts. Very cool track. Um, tell us a little bit more about recording this album and kind of the inspiration behind it. Sure, and yeah. The process so, and what, whenever you're writing music, what what is it that goes through your head? Yeah, wow. Okay, there was... Um, a lot of different a lot of different things that went into these songs i think was really over the course of probably a year or a year and a half that i was writing these tunes and then another um year of kind of like playing them with a band and then we like recorded it Mm -hmm. so they they had they had kind of run their course i i felt like when we were recording um we all like knew them really well. They had become really comfortable. Yeah, very ingrained. Um, th- there's there's a lot of different. I mean, the the mood of the album I think was is easier to identify um, in kind of like an aesthetic that I was going for ra- rather than like the subject matter of the lyrics. But mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> I think that in the spirit of what I was kind of mentioning earlier about combining the songwriting that I'm interested in with um, more of a textural type music right more about the ambiance yeah and i had been listening um a lot over those years to a lot of ambient music and um i had gone through different phases of like times where i would like only be listening to like harsh noise music or only listening to like really like new agey like ambient music Mm -hmm. or times where i'd just listen to tom petty you know it's like (laughs) all just like uh there's a lot of different things that that influence um what i kind of wanted to capture but Mm -hmm. i think the idea of with these songs and particularly with this band was to be able to um perform but also record an album that kind of would flow seamlessly from beginning to end and be right have a piece that was its own work and there'd be a lot of different moments to stop and wonder about a certain thing that was going on but it was uh constantly moving you know and Mm -hmm. a song might rise up through the 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 landscape and be in in the foreground and then it might sink back down and it would be be just the uh more of the undulating like soundscape that would be carrying the album so that was um more or less what was the attempt to capture while recording Mm -hmm. um when we went to ryan's to record um he and i both really wanted to record it to tape um that was kind of almost a requirement on both of our ends and he had this great half inch machine it was like an eight track otari half inch tape machine and we started tracking and it just it sounded really really nice really warm and we just had the whole band there for i think it was three days um, cool and we just so it wasn't a very long affair then no we, we did it all all the um all the tracks live so mm-hmm we would you know he had us all rigged up and it, it's fun you know it becomes kind of like a rube goldberg feeling in there <laughs> because there's amps placed in all different parts of the uh studio and cable right. running everywhere and just somehow, chaos yeah and you know you put on your pair of headphones and he mixes it all in, in your ears and it, it you know it's all super fun for, for me and mm-hmm. ryan's just like it it's a very like i mentioned before it was a very cozy feeling there and yeah we would like show up and just all hang out for like an hour like eating breakfast sandwiches and like drinking seltzer and like just talking about like chilling with your friends yeah totally and then it's like okay we should get started and (laughs) you know so it had a it had a friendly vibe which is really nice it kind of puts you more in the mood i think that the recording experience that could feel kind of static was like oh you know we're we're dishing out so much money for this time you know when we have to like really like lay down our track the best we can there's a crunch and then it could be with a a sound engineer you're not comfortable with they really know that well yeah um yeah sounds as you put it like definitely cozier Mm -hmm. to work with um someone you're already familiar with yeah Um, quick question did ryan mix um for evelyn was the name of your first album right he did mix that one yeah Yeah. i I recorded it that was kind of half recorded um by a friend of mine in montreal okay 
Um, and then the rest of it I had done at home on this like eight track machine that I had. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then it was, yeah, it was mixed a couple different times, but Ryan was like the last one to, uh, yeah, that to was have. the final stop was at Ryan's. Yeah. Board. Yeah. Cool. Um, what's on your plate these days? What are you, um, what are you thinking for future projects? Yeah, well, that's in the, you know, the spirit of the conversation of things always changing and like a different, different things happening. I think that after Dancing on Soda Lake came out and we, we performed that music some over the summer and then. Yeah, so you guys did a, an NNA showcase in Brooklyn. I saw a fly for that online. Oh yeah. That, that was, was like a pretty fun gig. That was a really nice time and so cool to be, just be able to you know, share a, a bill and, and a night playing with such amazing musicians. I kind of, mm-hmm. you know, I, I had kind of known um, and admired so many of the artists that are on that label for a really long time, but just to kind of be there and be like, oh, wow, like I'm, I feel really honored to be par- part of this. And it's really fun to talk with the other artists and kind of be part of this community. It was, a, that was another event that was yeah, it was just very like warm and cozy, you know. To, yeah. And I know that I drove down from Vermont with Toby, the you know mm-hmm. the partial owner of the label, and I know for him it was really like a exceptionally cool experience to just be like, wow, all these different bands that we released are all going to be playing the same show, and it was a lot to coordinate that many people. And some of those bands, it's like. Simon's band, Tradici Bachi, is like, you know, four, like an 11 piece band. Or 11, like four, I don't know, yeah. there's like a lot of people. So it, um, it, it took, I felt kind of bad for the uh, production manager and the sound person <laughs> yeah. of that show. Some of those email chains were pretty like treacherous. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, that was a really nice, that was a fun show to play. Mm-hmm. And I forget what the original question was. Oh, like uh, uh, what's uh, what's yeah, yeah what's, the, uh, the, what the are you plate. looking forward to? Yeah, yeah what's um next on the horizon for Ren Kits? Yeah, so um everything's a little bit different and I mm-hmm. think I uh, I played after the dancing on Soda Lake release and performing some of that music for what kind of felt like the last time, I think. Mm-hmm. Um and we, we'll keep playing that, that those songs and we are still playing those songs, but kind of felt like the chapter of the book had had flipped um you know having written some of the songs like so many years ago and then performed them or rehearsed them performed them recorded them it's like you feel like you're kind of running the well dry i think i think so i i was i think this summer um kind of more maybe like july august september like was more focused on some newer material that I was writing and Mm -hmm. a good friend of mine, Rob Voland, had moved back from Montreal where he was living back to um, this part of Vermont. So we had played music together in the past in this band called Violet Ultraviolet and I always admired his playing and just enjoyed spending time with him. Mm -hmm. We became friends and when I was interested in recording some of these new songs and showing them to people for the first time. Rob was kind of the first person who came to mind to share that stuff with and we, you know, I'd play him songs but more so he just wanted to record and he was really, uh, really helpful and kind of like boosting, you know, my confidence in the songs and is such an incredible musician that you know, we would go into his little studio and he has a, you know, four track cassette recorder and mm-hmm. he'd get behind the drum set having never heard the song before and I would, he'd just, he'd just start, you know, <laughs> and I would play the song and he'd, he'd hear it and he'd catch on and, and then we'd have drums and guitar tracked and then we'd like say, oh, what, what should we add next? Yeah. And we'd just keep building. You guys like a machine. Yeah. Just and running through it. And you know, we would meet every week, sometimes a couple times, and sometimes we'd just jam, and um, other times we'd get into working on one of my new songs. Yeah. Um, and sometimes we'd record just improvised things and, and just see what happened. But mm-hmm. having him back around, I, th- I think in a lot of ways it kind of 
really brought out this the sound that I was trying to capture, which was more of a, a rock and roll vibe. Cool. And, um, but I liked the idea of having like, uh, you know, a, a kind of drenched old rock and roll vibe, and a drenched in tape hiss and kind of like s- a psychedelia. Scratchy, yeah. yeah, like um, thirteen floor elevators, Red Crayola. Like yeah, old school, I psychedelic mean, stuff, right? yeah, that stuff, you know, yeah. mixed with just like straight Neil Young and Crazy Horse kind yeah. of vibes. So I think that has been that has been the focus recently. And um, the kind of demos that I brought are, are that style. And mm-hmm. I just um, those are the ones you brought tonight. That those are the ones share? I brought tonight. Oh, yeah. That's a shame. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was a. Uh, yeah, I think that um, about a month ago, a month and a half ago, it was the first time that I felt f- comfortable enough playing those songs live with a band. And yeah. we had just kind of, you know, um, Ross DeRay and Lauren Costello, who I'd been playing with for um, the last couple years, they mm-hmm. were just like right back on board with, with learning new songs. And we really only practiced a couple times and then just started playing shows. and. I think just in the last couple of months, we've played like five shows as like the the rock band. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's been it's been really fun. Do you and perform under the name Ren Kits though, or is it like yeah, oh, okay, yeah. It's still it's. I don't know if you're like labeling your like on the bill as the rock band. <laughs> like, no, that, that'd be uh, quite funny, but yeah, yeah. I mean, the the band going by my name really is it is for no better reason that than we just can never decide on a band name. You know? Right. Band names are hard. And it's like, they are. I think it's that even my bandmates are sometimes like, cheesy. well, your name's fine. Yeah. You know, it's like, uh, it, that's like, I just don't want people to feel like, oh, well, he's taking all the credit. Because the mm-hmm. other musicians uh, that have played with me over the last years are like a huge part of the way that it sounds. Like, mm-hmm. Um, I just show up with my silly acoustic guitar and song, and um, it, it's really a group effort to kind of sculpt them to where they end up. Okay, and so you don't come in and tell your bandmates, this is the part, this is how it's going to go. No, no, this that's is how it's going to be. That's not, that's not the way that I like to have a band. And mm-hmm. I, you know, I've played in bands where the, I really value an assigned part. Um, mm-hmm. I'm just not the best at at giving the assignment. I think as a band leader, I like the idea of having more um, each player. Uh, for my songs, at, at least for now, I like the idea that people can kind of have their own freedom to mm-hmm. improvise and um, let their own influence kind of take over and how they would want you know, the part to sound. And that's just, to me, more exciting um, and more collaborative. Which right, is, think, more inspiring too if you give other people the freedom to do what they want or yeah. you know play what fits i think that it really tastes. and it and i know for me this has been the case in various bands i've been in over the years but you you get ownership over a part that you, that you wrote you know if, if you come up with i know for me it's like oh i i, I wrote that cool riff you know <laughs> yeah. and, I, and i'm kind of proud to play it on this song and it, it makes me feel more attached to the song and more attached to the band and mm-hmm. but yeah. anyway, maybe that's weird that's just me no, I from speaking from my own experience, I definitely know where you're coming from. Yeah. Like even if it's you didn't write the song, you still feel like you kind of added a part, whether it's like a bass line or a keyboard part. That's kind of cool because it's like everyone writing a bunch of different melodies, and it all comes together to yeah. one larger piece. Yeah, and it's it's a sound. It's like you know, and that's you know, one thing about playing with Lauren Costello, who plays cello in the group. It's, mm-hmm. You know, she has such a, a particular way of playing and an aesthetic that um, has just b- become like a really huge part of like the way that the band sounds uh, when we play live. And mm-hmm. um, and I wouldn't want anything else besides that, you know, because yeah. that's just that's her sound. And I think that's that's quite cool. Yeah, that's it's the flavor you're looking for. Yeah. 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 So we did manage to get through our technical difficulties and have a way to pull some of the tracks that you brought in. Oh, cool. Yeah. Do you have any preference for which one you want to share? I mean, they're short and sweet. You could really play a few of them. Um, yeah. And they're all, they're all yeah, completely recorded uh, yeah. to um, four track. Um, 
to cassette with with my friend Rob Boland. It's just the two of us, kind of. Um, we usually track drums and guitar, and then take turns adding other stuff. And they're pretty improvised, but I like the way that they came out. And I think moving forward into a recording setting, these will give us a really great idea of um, how we want to approach the the tunes. Yeah, it gives you a point of reference. Yeah. So, yeah, they do look to be pretty short. We'll just play a few and hear how they sound. They're the the Pop Town demos, right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. The first one on the queue is called Hexed. You're listening to Rocket Shop.
found my own person and not out of any false humility.
that was Hexed, Yum, and Wander Boy, and Sky of Words by Ren Kitts. Some new unreleased stuff that he worked on over the summer. Um, I think we're about to be drowned out by Swale next door. Yeah, they sound good. I might go over and check it out. Yeah, maybe. I think Lee Ronaldo should be on sometime soon. Um, anything else you want to add, Ren, before we call it a night? Uh, nothing besides just thanks for having me to chat tonight. It was fun to be here and sit in this. No one knows this, but I'm in a very comfortable chair. <laughs> so it's it's been nice to come here and just it's very relaxing here. I like it. We're all about hospitality here on yeah. the radiator. Well thank you. Yeah, no thanks for stopping by Ren. Um, this has been Rocket Shop Radio. Up next we have more Vermont music. Have a good night.